organizers of this. It's a, it's a real honor and a privilege to be in this uh, uh, beautiful location. Uh, so as Avina said, uh, I'm Stash Hinckley. I'm from the University of uh, Exeter uh, in the UK. And I'm gonna be telling you about some of the work that uh, a team I'm leading has been doing. So looking at this plot that Jonathan Fortney started his talk with, I'm thankful for that, showing what I like to call the sort of demographics or the architectures uh, of exoplanetary systems. We see these populations of the radial velocity and the transit in the orange and light blue. Uh, but we also see these directly imaged planets at the upper right. Uh, and those are the planets that can only be reached uh, with the direct imaging method. But when I look at a plot like this, I'm more interested in the blank regions than the regions that are filled in. And uh, I'm drawn especially to this lower right-hand corner of this plot. Uh, it doesn't mean that planets don't exist there. It just means that we do not yet, yet, have the sensitivity to them, but now JWST is changing that, as I'll tell you. And it's that uncharted region of that parameter space that only the direct imaging method and only JWST will have sensitivity to. And I think any successful model of planet formation really needs to fill out all the demographics of exoplanetary systems. It's particularly exciting. It's worth saying also that these these planets in the upper right, those dark blue points, are really amenable to direct spectroscopy. We can get photons directly from the atmospheres of these planets themselves. So that's a real advantage. But typically, so far, we've only been doing that from, say, one to two microns. And now that's changing. So I don't know many of you in the room, but I just wanted to quickly introduce myself. I uh, am a professor at the University of Exeter, but I'm originally from the United States. And I have kind of a deep instrumentation background, actually. So you can see a picture of me there on the right in one of my... Uh, natural habitats formerly. But a lot of my time in the last few years has been spent uh, leading and organizing the direct imaging community uh, to win one of the, the early release science programs, JWST. And it's been a magnificent experience. And we've really emerged from that with a very unified uh, 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 community that's really going forward well. In our early release science program, we were allocated 75 hours. We, it was a major goal of ours to really have early career people uh, lead some of the first results. So I'm going to be highlighting the work of Brittany Miles now, who's now at Arizona. My former PhD student, Aaron Carter, who's now landed a permanent position at Space Telescope, which I'm thrilled about, as well as Trish Moy Ray, my, my most recent uh, PhD student. So in our early release science program, despite its rather large allocation of time, we only looked at three objects, three systems, really. The left one is HIP 65426. This is a, a fairly widely separated extrasolar planet at about 90 AU from its host star. And that's really amenable to testing the coronagraphs of JWST. The other target is VHS 1256B, shown there in the middle. And this is a planetary mass companion that's separated from its host star by eight arc seconds. So that really lends itself to doing spectroscopy directly on this object. We also imaged a circumstellar disk, which I won't talk about because the analysis of that is ongoing. So, I'd like to organize just my few minutes that I have here under around three fundamental questions in exoplanetary science and maybe how JWST is helping us with those and, and looking towards the future. <clears throat> the first I think has to do with architecture. We'd really like to understand what are the demographics of exoplanets at all orbital separations. And I'm specifically thinking of that lower right-hand corner of the diagram. The second question might be related to atmospheres and ask maybe can we begin to link our measurements of atmospheric composition with the formation history, some of the things that Jonathan touched on. And lastly, sort of a forward-looking uh, point of view, I want to think about the power of an image and the power of directly imaging a planet, whether that's our own planet or whether that's an extrasolar planet. And I want to think a little bit and talk a little bit about how JWST will inform us about how we will directly image uh, terrestrial planets uh, in the coming decades. So moving along to what we actually carried out in this program, we were very fortunate to obtain some of the early direct images of an extrasolar planet with JWST. And I must say that I feel very privileged to be presenting uh, this work, which is now public. Uh, and this really builds up the thousands of people that uh, really worked to make JWST a success, uh, especially George and Marcia, and, and also Renee over there, and as well as the, the near spec team. When we actually just look at a star with one of the JWST coronagraphs, this is the typical image that we might get at the 3.6 micron. We see a tremendous amount of residual scattered starlight. But we can actually remove that in post processing to obtain an image of the solar planet there. We see actually a nice six fold symmetry 
uh, of the exoplanet there. When we do this with MIRI, we see a slightly different pattern of residual scattered starlight, but removing uh, that starlight again, we see a very, very clear image of this extrasolar planet. And this was a remarkable moment because we've never seen photons from an extrasolar planet directly at 11 microns. This was a, this was a very big moment. We've, we've never ever been able to characterize planets at these wavelengths before. Uh, so this was particularly exciting. I think what this is also showing us is we are learning how to do coronography in space, high performance coronography in space for the first time. And this is gonna be very valuable for things like habitable worlds. Part of the reason this has been so successful and that the coronagraphs are performing better than expected is due to the incredible stability of JWST. And I stole this plot from Lee Feinberg uh, from a screenshot from one of his talks. What we're seeing here is actually the wavefront map of the primary mirror there at the left. It looks like the date is July 3rd of last year. And two days later, we see the wavefront maps. These are just the aberrations of the wavefronts. We're talking about tens of nanometers here, 60 nanometer RMS deviation. So those two, two plots on the, on, the, on the left in the middle look very similar. And that blank looking spot in my slide is not actually a blank spot. That's the difference of those two things, the difference of those two wavefront maps over two days. So we're talking about wavefront drifts of 120 picometers per hour. So I'm actually just thrilled that we're sitting here talking about wavefront drifts on the order of picometers for JWST. And this allows really precise precision differential measurements to happen in space using the coronagraphs. So we are thrilled that JWST is performing as well. This stability translates directly into our ability to really probe down into that lower right region of parameter space. So I'm showing the mass and semi-major axis separation here. Uh, and the dark green regions are the estimated sensitivity for JWST at 4.4 and 15 microns. Those dashed lines show our previous sensitivity from the very best ground-based instrument that we have for, for imaging uh, directly imaged planets. In the Gemini Planet Imager, uh, we see a similar thing. And what I'm showing here is sphere and from the field. So JWST can really probe down into these regions and uh, gives us sensitivity to Saturn mass analogs, maybe even Neptune mass analogs, at very wide orbital separations, tens or even hundreds of years. So that's particularly exciting. But getting these observations of these of, of this exoplanet at totally new wavelengths, talking about 11 microns, 15 microns. And the precise photometry that we're able to measure for this really allows us to get a very precise S spectral energy distribution for this object, getting basic things, like temperature, gravity, things like that. And we're, so we're covering something like 97% of the full luminous range of the planet. That's never been done before. That's really exciting. But this is photometry, and really what we'd like to do is detail the process. So that sort of gets me to my second point related to atmosphere, how we can begin to extract very precise abundance from atmospheres. So the object I mentioned, VHS 1256b, is shown up there at the upper left to jog your memory. And what I'm about to show is an early direct spectrum of a planetary mass companion with JWS. And this is what it looks like. This is from the press release that we had. And we were thrilled when we saw this come in. Um, the, the just exquisite detail that's inherent in this spectrum is really remarkable. It's all the usual stuff, water, carbon monoxide, uh, methane, what I'm particularly excited in are the silica, about nine microns. I think it's worth me mentioning also that the previous me measurements span something like this. So now we're seeing really the full luminous range of an extrasolar planet at spectral resolution of a few thousand. If we look a little bit closer at that spectrum, the detail is just really remarkable. And it really matches up very well with, with uh, models for these uh, uh, carbon monoxide band factors. Four to five microns. So I think this is the beginnings of what I hope is our opportunity to uh, get multiple spectroscopic features for, for directly imaged planets uh, as afforded by the long wavelength coverage. And hopefully this will translate to much more precise abundance. And hopefully this is the beginnings of our sort of population level between transiting and directly imaged planets. So I think this is really remarkable. The silicate feature that I'm particularly excited about, most people on the public were very excited to hear that we're discovering sand grains in the atmosphere of an extrasolar planet. And that was, I think, very well received. And it's, uh, it's very exciting. So I wanna end at the, at the last few minutes of my talk, just thinking very, very big picture here about the power of, of an image. 
and what we as scientists can really, uh, we, we really have a privileged position and a powerful when we engage with the public to think about the image of a planet and whether that planet is ours or whether that planet is another terrestrial planet, which I believe we will see not too, too long. Um, and we're learning how to do this now with JWST. Our early release science program and the GTO programs were really the beginning of doing precision coronography in space. Those lessons learned will translate directly to what we'll do with Roman, and those will translate directly to what we'll do with Hubble. But thinking back, I think I like to tell some of my students about this amazing moment uh, in 1990 when Voyager 1 uh, actually turned around as it was leaving our solar system to take what some people call the family portrait of our solar system. I think most people are aware of this, but I actually I found this image, which I really like. You can really see how they tiled the solar system to get images of, of all the planets in our own solar system. And I think we've all seen this, but it's worth, I think, bringing this back to your institution, because this is what really particularly excites students. And it also reminds us uh, in the public about kind of the fragility of our own Earth in the, in the cosmic arena, I would say. Um, and I actually just went over this with my students on, on February 14th of this year, because this is the what, 34th anniversary of this image being taken. And I think that the words of Carl Sagan are really very kind of um, prescient right now, especially when we're engaging with the, the climate crisis, uh, where he said basically that it's been said that astronomy is a humbling and character building experience. There's perhaps no better demonstration of the folly of human conceit than this distant image of our tiny world. To me, it underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly with one another and to preserve and cherish pale blue dot, the only home we've ever known. So I think it's worth just sort of bringing this back to our institutions and bringing this back to the public so that we can remind ourselves that we don't have another Earth. This is it. We think of the Earth as this sort of large, indestructible place. When you look at this image, I think this can really change how you think about things. So looking ahead, I think that we can use images like this to really um, think about how we're going to, to, to gather images of other terrestrial planets, because it really is not that far away. It's going to happen in most of our life. And I think that this is maybe best demonstrated by the, the, the recommendations of the 2020 Decadal Survey, um, where the highest overall priority was a future IR opportunity for telescope, which is optimized for observing habitable planets and general astronomy. Really, what the precise recommendation was, NASA should embark on a program to realize a mission to search for biosignatures from a robust number of about 25 habitable known planets. And I really like the way that this was presented in the report, because this really gave, gave birth to this habitable world observatory. And the wheels are turning very fast, I'm sure everybody in this room knows. But I really like the way they put it. They said, the scientific goals of this mission, when achieved, have the potential to change the way that we as humans view our place in the universe. So I think that we're kind of at the beginning of understanding how we directly image planets precisely and optimally using space-based. And like I said, that's going to, what we're learning now with JWST is going to transfer directly over to Roman, going to transfer over directly to the habitable world. So this is going to be a really exciting journey. For the so I think I'll leave it there uh, and just sort of highlight what I talked about. I talked about the architectures of planetary. It's really only JWST that's going to be able to tell us about these analog Saturn, Saturns and Neptunes in the outer solar, outer reaches of our solar system. And any complete theory of planet formation needs to account for the population across the entire parameter space. So we're really excited that JWST is, we can confirm that JWST is sensitive to a totally new class of, of these exoplanets. So thank you for building such exquisite instruments. Um, in terms of atmospheres, this long wavelength coverage is what I think is the beginning of our abilities to connect these precise abundance measurements with a formation history of planets. That's really where this is headed. And I think that now we know that the, the precise abundances with JWST um, are arriving, and that's the beginning. And I just wanted to leave you with what I talked about earlier, the power of an image, is that uh, the direct detection of Earth-like planets and the detection biosignatures may in fact occur in our lifetime. So that's a particularly exciting uh, place to be, I think. So I'll leave it there and uh, take any questions.